This session doesn't need introducing. All of us who have been in the battle lines and in the actual fighting when it comes to the EPAs, we have experienced the disagreement in terms of process, in terms of content, uh, the imbalances. So we have experienced all these challenges. This session will look at those experiences and lessons and how we can be able to use those experiences to be able to go forward in the post Kotunu. So what do we take forward in those what we have experienced um, in the in the post Kotunu process? Uh, I, I will start with Mark. We are here now to discuss uh, the post Kotunu uh, negotiations. Uh, if we want to look at EPAs, we have to go back to the post lomé negotiations. Uh, in, in those days, end of the 90s, we were fighting very hard against the multilateral, multilateral agreement on investment, the MAI in the OECD, and against, of course, the Millennium Round that the EU was cooking up, uh, only to find that in 2000, when the Cotton Agreement was signed, there were horrible things in there about trade. And I have... Uh, sort of deja vu. We're now uh, preparing for post Cotonou and uh, it's only when, when the draft mandate came out from the EU a few uh, months ago that we also saw that again it, this is full of trade language and uh, while everybody thinks this is about you know renewal of partnership and so forth and so forth uh, all these kinds of things are sneaking sneaking in. So back to the, to the middle of the 90s when the negotiations uh, around post Lomé were, were happening, uh, the EU uh, proposed to the ACP countries to uh, make an end, bring an end to the unilateral preferences of the European Union towards uh, the ACP countries and to change that trade relation into a series of free trade agreements. Uh, the ACP countries have resisted that for a very long time, uh, but when the Cotton Agreement was uh, finished and signed, there was this famous Article 36 in the Cotton Agreement saying that the ACP countries agreed and would negotiate a free trade agreement uh, compatible with WTO rules then prevailing. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw the uh, Ambassador Gunise from Mauritius, who was the Dean of the ACP Ambassadors in Brussels, uh, and I asked him, what happened? Why, why have you accepted to, to negotiate these FTAs? Why have you put that in the Cotton Agreement? And he said, what can you do? If, if, the, if, if our biggest trading partner and our biggest donor says that's what we have to do, then that's what we had to do. And he said, we also didn't have any support in Europe, in public opinion. It seemed that the whole of Europe <laughs> wanted us to, to go that road. Uh, so that, that article was in there, but the ACPs during the post cotton negotiations have tried to reduce the damage and so there's language in article 40, uh, 34 and 35 of Cotonou stressing that uh, the EU should respect the, uh, the uh, political development objectives of the ACP countries, they should respect the different needs and capacities, they should respect regional integration and they should also offer an alternative for those ACP countries that were not in this position to to accept EPAS. And the ACP also managed to get this little line into Article 36 saying WTO then prevailing. Because of course they knew at the end of, of the post lomé negotiations that the EU was uh, launching negotiations, uh, wanted to launch negotiations in WTO. And the ACP countries were hoping that in these door development round negotiations they could also change the article of the WTO on free trade agreements. Because you have this very stupid and strange situation in the World Trade Organization that is that if developing countries negotiate trade liberalization with each other 
these treaties can be based on the enabling clause allowing developing countries to open whatever they feel they can cope with. And Article 24 of GATT says that if WTO members negotiate with each other, they have to open up essentially all trade in a short period of time. So developing countries, they can choose the level of liberalization. Developed countries, they have to do essentially all. But what happens if developed countries negotiate with developing countries? Then the developing countries also have to do essentially all. That's nonsense. I mean, it goes so much against the enabling clause. So the ACP countries were hoping that they could still change that. And indeed, in 2005, they tabled a proposal in the WTO to change that. Because the situation was, in the IPA negotiations, the EU was asking for 80% trade liberalization, and there was no special differential treatment foreseen, uh, except perhaps in the length of the, of the uh, implementation period. So the ACP countries were hoping that they would get the notion into that, that when we countries, like most of the Western African countries, are least developed countries, when they negotiate free trade with a rich country bloc like the EU, then they have they are entitled to special differential treatment and they do not have to do the essentially all. So that was, so they, the ACP countries in the post lomain negotiations were forced to accept uh, the idea of negotiating FTAs, but they tried to put language in there that would give them uh, some, some comfort. Then once the Cotonou Agreement was into place, <coughs> The EU Commission came with draft negotiating guidelines, like today. <laughs> like today for the post Cotonou negotiations, we have the European Commission has come out with draft negotiating guidelines. Uh, this time it has published them, but in 2000, the EU uh, draft negotiating guidelines were secret, secret internal document. Nobody was allowed to see it. We managed to get hold of it through a leak. And what did we see? What the European Commission was proposing to the European Council and to the Member States was a negotiating mandate for the most comprehensive, deepest trade agreements that the EU at that point had ever started to negotiate. And indeed, when the Caribbean concluded a regional IPA at the end of 2007, that was at that time the most comprehensive and deep free trade agreement that the EU had ever obtained. This was full of the new language and the new issues. Services was in there, government procurement was in there, trade facilitation was in there, intellectual property rights were in there, and so forth and so forth. Horrendous. This was not, this was not what is in Article 36. Like Article 36, negotiating EPAS was about goods, and the EU came with the whole truckload of issues. These issues are also in the Cotton Agreement. The Cotton Agreement, I don't know whether you have looked at it recently, it's, it's a, like a telephone book, eh? it's big and it keeps on listing issues and issues and issues and issues that the EU and the ACP countries can work together on, can cooperate on. So yes, services are in the Cotton Agreement, but there it says the two parties will work together to strengthen their services, their services industry and their services provision. So there was no language about negotiating trade, yet the EU came with this huge mandate for very comprehensive EPA. So from day one, from the moment that this was out, it was clear that the EU was looking in this direction and the ACP looking, were looking in that direction. And the EU had already betrayed what was in the agreement. They, their plans were beyond that. Um, so that was the first point of discussion. I mean, this was not what the ACP countries had in mind when they started to negotiate the, the EPAS. And then, during the negotiations, of course, a big discussion was also between the ACP countries and the EU about the develop, development dimension of the EPAS. So for the ACP countries, it was clear, you are demanding from us a legally binding commitment that we will open up our markets for European goods, if you ask this from us, we want a legally binding commitment from the EU that you will make sure that we have the means for the flanking measures and to prepare ourselves for this trade liberalization. Because how are we going to open the market and face European competition if we cannot beef up our infrastructure, our, our, our production capacities, our institutions, and so forth and so forth. So 
we, you ask us to sign, we will open, and then we will have to face the, competent, the, the consequences in the end. And how are we going to prepare ourselves for that? So what is your commitment on your side? And it took the EU until the end of 2006, so that is uh, five years of negotiating, to finally accept that they would insert development cooperation language in the EPAS. So if there's a commitment to be made on the ACP side, there's a commitment to be made on the EU side to support ACP countries in preparing that. But it took five years of negotiating just for, just for this, which, which for us, all of us, was obvious. Uh, but that, that took a very long time. Then the EU also in, in 2006 spent a whole year negotiations between the European Commission and the Member States on the new chapter for services, investment and e-commerce. And once there was agreement within the European Union that this was going to be the new chapter on services, investment and e-commerce, they tabled it as a whole in each of every ACP region. And that happened in the mid of 2007. So you remember that the, the, ACP, the EPA negotiations were supposed to end at the end of 2007. Uh, and so on that basis, the EU had asked a waiver in the WTO for the continuation of the preferences. But in the mid of 2007, the EU came with this giant chapter on services liberalization, investment liberalization, and e-commerce. Wow. This is what, you want, what we want you to sign up to. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 was, that, was, uh, that was so impossible uh, to, to deal with. Only the Caribbeans uh, accepted it and, and they, came to, they came to, like I said, the most comprehensive agreement that the EU had ever obtained at that time. Then, of course, came the end of 2007. There were no EPAs yet, except for the Caribbean. Uh, and everybody was pushing the European Union for going back to the WTO and extend the waiver, extend the WTO waiver for the trade preferences for the ACP countries so the negotiations can go on. Just go back and say, look, you know, we have tried to do this with a group of countries, more than half of le our least developed countries. They are normally exempt from trade liberalization commitments in the WTO. We are not ready yet. Can we please get more time? But the EU f refused that. They said, no, we're, gonna do, we're not going to do that. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make interim EPAs, bilateral interim EPAs. And that's what they came up with at the end of 2007. At the very last moment, this was, this was end of November, beginning of December. And these, these, these interim EPAs that the EU had drafted, they carried an expiry date. It said, this offer is valid until the 12th of December. If you do not accept it, you have lost your preferences on the 1st of January 2008. So that, I have never seen anything like that. It's like, you know, sign here and that's it and an expiry date. So countries signed up. And as early as the 13th of December, the ACP Council of Ministers, they issued a statement saying, guys, okay, we have accepted these interim EPAs because there was no other choice. But these papers contain issues that we haven't even discussed in our seven years of negotiations. There is a standstill in there, there's restrictions on export subsidies and export taxes in there, there's an MFN clause in there. Where do they come from? We don't agree with these issues. So they, they, they had a new long list of contentious issues. So after that, in 2008, negotiations continued for three things. One, the ACP uh, countries wanted to get of these contentious issues. Two, they wanted to uh, repair the cracks in regional integration because in West Africa the EU had, came, had come up with, with these uh, interim EPAs for Ghana and Ivory Coast, but what of the rest of the region? The, the region was determined to do this together, but there, there was now a crack in that, in that regional uh, uh, construction. So negotiations continued on contentious issues, negotiations continued on trying to bring the region together again, and of course, the agenda from the EU side was, okay, now we have surpassed the deadline of 2007. Uh, we have the interim EPAs. We can now continue our negotiations and make sure that we have comprehensive, deep EPAs. And it took another two years of hard campaigning until finally, in April 2009, the European Commissioner for Trade, Lady Ashton, at that time, in the European Parliament, 
was forced to make a statement in which she said, okay, we will only negotiate the Singapore issues and the comprehensive issues with those countries that are interested and willing to negotiate them. <laughs> so it took the EU like eight years to abandon the comprehensive approach for EPAS that was not even in the Cotonou Agreement. First of all, for many of us um, in the Carreform region, the kind of view that we had of the process was one that not only suggested but really ev evidenced a democratic deficit. There was a deliberate ploy by negotiators um, to ensure that civil society within Carreform did not have access to the negotiation process um, in terms of even sight of text, but also as well access to negotiation spaces. Yeah. I think one of the hallmarks um, in relation to the resistance um, within the care form is that we really made a conscious effort to take the resistance to the street. And that is extremely important, an extremely important lesson. So more than us who got access, it was the voices of the farmers, of the 5,000 banana farmers who paid their own money by boat to attend a massive march um, in St. Lucia when the, negotiations were, when the negotiators were actually meeting that opened the door. So that we have to be careful um, that we ensure um, that we bring those voices to bear and not answer the process just with our own elite voices. And, and for me, the other kind of key lesson as well is that we need to be able to craft our own framework for involvement. Least, again, we become on the back foot by allowing them, again, to create and carve out for us our own space and that we need to be very careful at the forefront um, to have our own agenda and our own framework for how we would like to see ourselves being involved and included into the process and bring that to the table very, very, very early. Hence, or uh, rather least we end up with another kind of consultative committee framework, again, that does not um, do justice. Um, to the process as well. So for me, from a, a kind of process um, perspective, I think those were um, some, key, some key lessons. Um, I think in terms of content, I think Martin did a really good um, job in terms of you know, really highlighting the fact that for it within Carform, um, we entered into the negotiations and had for some, not for some reason, because we can identify the reasons, um, an agreement which even went beyond what was required for WTO um, compatibility. Yeah. And an agreement um, on things like intellectual, and intellectual property, competition, public procurement, um, personal data protection, all of those things. And for me, there were two kind of, of, of or rather three kind of prevailing impetus that I think are important for us to be able to, to understand. We like the narrative of state capture. We like the narrative of these bad Europeans who came in and held this big stick over our heads and culled us um, you know, into taking these demands. Unfortunately for me, um, I have another narrative and that suggests that we were complicit. And from the Cariform region, I say that our negotiators were complicit because they bought into the neoliberal hegemony and believed fundamentally, believed fundamentally that undertaking an agreement and entering into the scale of that agreement was going to be a good thing for the region. They fundamentally believe that the answer to addressing the supply side constraints and the development deficits within the, within the region lied within a broad and comprehensive agreement with the EU. So, so I hope that is not too contentious. But for me, that is what I saw. That is my honest evaluation of the process. It wasn't so much um, a big stick, but that our Caribbean negotiators really fundamentally believe that this was um, important um, for the region in terms of going forward as well. Um, I think as well, because my, my time is going to go pretty, um, uh, pretty quickly. I wanted to look at two things. Right? That, this whole notion of this development agenda. So within the Cariform region, there was this big show and discussion around including 
um, development within the agreement. So if you look at the text of the of the agreement, it talks about ensuring. I'm gonna. I know my time has run out. I, I'm gonna make my last my last um, point. It talks about you know ensuring that the agreement um, is good for men and women and children. Listen, it's so romantic. It sounds so good. It could have been written by civil society ourselves, right? But if you look at the context of the rest of the agreement, there's nothing that relates to achieving that agenda. Huh? So again, it was one of those carrot and, 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 and stick things. Again, if I quote Norman Gervin, he talked about the sweetification of the agreement. And this was one of the sweetification aspects that we ought to be very, very, very um, wary of right um in in terms of that the the next thing i want to talk about the final point because I, I see jane and everybody looking at me so i'm looking the other way uh, was this notion that the agreement was going to respect um the regional integration framework of the of the, of the caribbean that it was going to be able to help us but not impose but interestingly you have we and i'm and again personalizing it we sign an agreement that include all of these, you know, extra issues that had not been worked out in the context of our own regional integration process. So it ran, it ran counter to even what we in the region were doing within the regional integration framework. We had not yet contemplated these issues amongst ourselves. We had not negotiated our own space, our own framework, but at the same time, we were agreeing to do so in the context of an economic partnership agreement with the EU. Again, you know, so that there were a, a number of conflicting agendas and, and philosophies that emerged, that emerged there. And very finally as well, so in 2011, I come to the end of the picture where we are, we had seven countries um, that failed to meet um, their tariff liberalization um, obligations within the agreement in 2011. So that's post the, post the agreement. Huh? We had, in 2015, many of the institutional um, mechanisms that were established to support EPA implementation um, were kind of dying or no more. So all of the implementation units, et cetera, that had been established within the Caribbean governments, national um, governments, were, were actually then being dissolved and, 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 being, and being closed um, as well. And even at the regional level as well, um, you are seeing I want to call it a lack of energy, a lack of, of, of discourse, and a lack of movement um, on, on, on the EPA so far. Mark is right. When we started uh, the campaign in May, it was only those of us around the table. But by the time we got to about seven years later, uh, poultry farmers in Cameroon were pointing out to how unhealthy chicken from you know, Europe was going. And many other people were involved in it. So there's a broad range, church groups. And they were all coming at it by understanding the issues that we were raising and how it affected them and finding ways of putting pressure on their government. I think where we didn't do well much is to deepen that relationship. So for instance, in Ghana, we could have done better if we had got domestic producers, huh? domestic enterprises. It, we, we came late to discover, for instance, that actually the people who suffered most from EPA are there people who don't even export to Europe? They only export to West Africa. Uh, people who produce plastics and cassava chips and things. Who didn't even know anything? They are the people who actually are businesses, entrepreneurs, local capitalists, right? Who were taking money and investing and they are losing their market. Now, I suspect somewhere that in the, in the civil society narrative, we had a certain reticence to work with our own local Business. capitalists. Yeah. So we thought somehow that uh, if I were the language of commodification is bad, everything is a commodity. But in fact, when we look at the situation of different countries, in a particular way, our domestic capitalists are as much our allies against the EPAs as the big transnational corporation. So our ability to analyze our reality and our society in all its nuances and to make appropriate alliances is what we are lacking. Let us not beat ourselves too much about representation. I don't represent anybody, but I have a right to talk. But I know that I cannot talk effectively if I don't engage my conversation with others who share my situation, who actually have more power than I have because they are people who come from the street. So that, that is a challenge. How do we take that forward?